uh, oldest child turned 25 this year and I started with the county before her birth. So it's been quite a while and a number of different positions within the county, including starting out at the Comprehensive Healthcare Center um, back in the late 70s. So um, I've been director of the Health and Human Services Department since June of 2004. I'm sorry, June of 2001, so it'll be four years um, next year. So it's been a uh, real pleasure uh, serving in that capacity and working with the management team and the staff at the Health and Human Services Department. And uh, as you said, a number of years with the department starting at the Comprehensive Healthcare Center and prior to becoming director, you were actually division manager of uh, social services. That's correct. I did that for a number of years and prior to that I was actually a social work supervisor with responsibility for a number of special projects and as I look back at that time, uh, wrote the first county community youth and family aids plan, the first community options program plan, um, so really had the experience in a number of different areas within the department and I think as director as I look back even though some of that knowledge is a bit um, outdated, um, it gives me a good perspective on how we can integrate services not only within the department but within the county structure as a whole. Well, we could take this entire program and talk about Ann's experience because not only is she a tremendous asset to Sheboygan County, but the state is also drawn on her as well to participate in some state uh, committees and the governor's appointed her to the Among uh, um, Refugee Resettlement Task Force. Thank That's you, correct. Ann. So uh, she definitely is uh, a tremendous asset to all of us. And why don't you start by sharing with our viewers not only the little bit you did about yourself, but those who aren't aware of the, the mission of the Health and Human Services Department. W what is that core mission? Okay. In actual terms, it's just to improve the quality of life and self-sufficiency for all Sheboygan County residents. Um, I sometimes say this, but it is true. We serve people um, pre-birth all the way through death. So we kind of say a little bit, it's womb to tomb. When you look at the services we provide in the Division of Public Health, we're very concerned about the unborn child and healthy pregnancies, good nutrition. And for some people in our community, based on their economic situation, through our economic support division, we actually assist people with the burial process and everything in between. Um, so it is a, a wide range of services that we do provide. Um, we are located in three locations right now, too, with our economic support W-2 agency at the Job Center on Wilgus Avenue, our main building for those lifelong Sheboygan residents being in the old Sheboygan Clinic on North A Street, and then our annex uh, location on North A Street a little bit further to the south in the former Baxter building. So we're located in three locations at this point in time and providing those services. And you're organized by five different divisions. Maybe that'd be a good way to share with folks the, the primary organizational structure. Sounds good. And I do have five division managers for each of those divisions. Um, I'll start with the Job Center, which we talked about being the location for economic support W-2. That is the division that provides eligibility determination for financial assistance. And for many people, they're familiar with the food stamp program. That program is now called Food Share. It's no longer food stamps. And individuals who are eligible um, can obtain a Quest card, and that is much like a debit card, that the um, food share um, allocation is put on that card, and they use it just like a debit card in the grocery store. Um, for some of our elderly individuals who are receiving food share, it might be 10 or $15 a month, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think of an older person who might want to save that up from the first of the year through Thanksgiving, and provide a Thanksgiving meal for the family or, or be able to participate in that, um, it can mount up over a 12-month period, that 10 or $15. For our lower income households, food, food share, which is now the program, definitely comes in handy in terms of stretching limited budgets. They also determine eligibility for medical assistance, um, and we also operate the W-2 or Wisconsin Works program out of the um, Job Center. We have the Division of Community Programs, and that is a very expansive division, including all the behavioral health, which is your substance abuse and mental health. In addition, that is the area of service primarily responsible for long-term support services to people with um, disabilities. It could be a developmental disability, a physical disability, or infirmities of aging. And what we do there is work to keep people um, in the community versus going into a nursing home or at least hitting that continuum of care at the appropriate time in their life. We also have, as you mentioned before, the Division of Social Services and Marty Bonk is a division manager of that. 
that uh, area of our um, program basically has responsibility for all of child protective services, that's all the abuse and neglect for children, and also for juvenile justice, and those are our young people who tend to get themselves into some trouble in the community, anything from truancy um, all the way through um, armed robbery, burglaries, those types of things. And I forgot to mention, Joan Ketterman is our division manager for community programs, and Liz Mollick is our manager for economic support. Um, the fourth division is our division on aging, and Jim McCabe is that division manager, formerly and oftentimes still called the Office on Aging. Primary responsibility for the elderly, and when you ask about who's elderly and who's not, it varies depending upon the program, so there's no magic time that you become elderly. It's, it's based on certain program criteria. Primarily, they're known for their nutrition sites, their senior dining sites throughout the county, and we have nine of those, and individuals can partake not only in the congregate meal activity, but other activities that might be um, counseling on nutrition. We bring in um, people to help prepare taxes, um, apply for energy assistance right at those senior dining sites, and also the Handicare um, Transportation Program for the elderly and people with disabilities. And this year we got two new buses through a state grant, so that's been very, very helpful in that area. <clears throat> And then um, our final division, which I'm drawing a blank on at this point in time, and I'm on that floor, and it's public health, <laughs> and it's Dale Hippenstiel as a division manager. Um, public health uh, ranges from our hotel restaurant inspection program to prenatal care that I talked about earlier, the Women, Infant, and Children, or WIC program, um, school health, and as we'll probably talk about a little bit later, some of the activities that always occur during the winter with flu and, and other things like that. But um, definitely more in the area of um, prevention with immunizations, making sure children are immunized, lead abatement, um, and healthier lifestyles for all of us. So economic support, uh, social services, mm -hmm. uh, public health, office on aging, and community programs. programs. Very good. Yeah. If I could draw a blank <laughs> in as short period of time as you just did a minute ago, we'd all be in better shape. Yep. Very good, a great overview. Now, these division managers and yourself, obviously, a tremendous amount of responsibility. You provide important leadership. How many employees are working at the Health and Human Services Department? Well, when I started, we had just over 200, and with downsizing and some of the budget reductions and changes that we were able to make, we're at 189 employees. A few of those are part-time, but um, I'd say that's down to about four um, different individuals that are part-time at this point in time. The rest are full-time. And for the benefit of our viewers who have perhaps heard some of this information for the first time or are interested in learning more about how a program or service might be able to help them or a friend or a loved one, how would they go about getting that type of information? Okay. I'm going to give two general numbers out, and I'll, I'll do it twice just so everybody knows. 459-6400 is our main number for our main building. With that process, you would access actually the voicemail system that would give you prompts in terms of if you're seeking a certain type of area. If you don't want to listen to those prompts, you can hit zero and an actual person will answer the phone and be able to direct your phone call. Also for our job center, it would be 208-5800. Um, and that would take you directly to a main number at the job center in terms of W-2 or any of the financial assistance programs. So again, 459-6400 and 208-5800. I think it's important to note that some of our, um, the people that we actually work with and provide services to are not voluntary clients. Um, so for people that wish to uh, refer a case to us, let's say for child abuse neglect or suspected elder abuse, they can look in the phone book and actually find an extension that would get them to report that. But if they do call uh, the main number at 459-6400, um, that would be able to direct them to the correct place. But we provide information and referral and assistance um, more in terms of prevention. But there are other ways that we do um, provide services, and that would be through an involuntary process. And final question before I turn it over to Bill. Uh, all of these programs and services that are available, obviously providing such an important niche in the community, but how many people do you think the department serves on an annual basis? Uh, when we talk about this every year, I keep saying, one of these years I'm going to have an information system with an unduplicated <laughs> count, but since the state of Wisconsin can't reach that point, I'm not sure Sheboygan County can either. In going through the various systems that we have in terms of data collection, 
Um, on an average, we serve between 30 to 35,000 distinct individuals. Now, some of those would be part of a family unit, um, but that's a significant part of the population, and that's as close as we can get to an unduplicated count. Um, some people may be receiving services from economic support and also public health, so um, they may be receiving more than one service also. Well, the population of Sheboygan County is about 112, 115,000, so right. that department is touching the lives of 25% or better of our, of our friends and neighbors in the community. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Okay. Um, as you know, I worked in the human services field for most of my career and also served on the Human Services Board, and I would just like to tell you how much I appreciate the job that's being done by Sheboygan County Human Services Department, and especially with you as director. Thank now, you, Bill. Now, that said, most of the funding for our programs comes from the state and federal government, although there is a fair amount of county dollars that go into it. Most of those funding streams have stayed fairly steady or decreased, mm -hmm. but are there any areas where the state has helped to expand programs that were actually going further? Than we did before. Absolutely, and as you said, our budget is, is significant. It's about $39 million, and out of that $11 million, approximately, is tax levy and the balance of state and federal funding. Most recently, as you know, with the state budget crisis, the state is looking for new ways to provide funding to counties in terms of service delivery. Uh, bioterrorism has been a, a big push at the federal level with the Homeland Security and our public health unit and division has been very, very involved in bioterrorism planning along with um, Steve from our emergency government. Just about a month ago I uh, participated in the tabletop in Ozaki County which is one of our partners um, in terms of bioterrorism planning and um, the actual exercise they go through is just an excellent learning tool if we'd ever have to face some actual crisis. So bioterrorism has been one of the areas. In addition, the state has really expanded some funding in terms of medical assistance waivers, and that would be our comprehensive community services grant, which will allow us to provide services to existing clients with mental health needs, but expand that population and allow us to access um, federal dollars at the 60% level. So that's been very, very helpful to us also. Um, as you're aware, with the refugee resettlement and as Adam referred to with the Governor's Task Force, the state has made additional uh, Wisconsin Works W-2 revenue available, not only to meet the refugee resettlement needs, but also um, the growing needs in the W-2 population. Okay. As we talked about, little federal mandates continue to change over time, and there is currently a change going on with the ICFMR. How will that and other changes impact your operation? Right. The ICFMR being the Intermediate Care Facility for Mental Retardation is a unit within uh, many county nursing homes that provides um, long-term care institutional services to people with developmental disabilities. The legislation will prohibit um, long-term placements being made in those ICFMR facilities effective January 1st of 2005. So it will limit new admissions to ICFMRs. In addition, we'll have to begin doing assessments of current residents and determine what might be a more appropriate setting. And in the state and federal terms, that's called most integrated setting. For some individuals, they'll be able to continue to remain in the facility, but at a nursing skill level versus an ICFMR level. In some cases, the court will actually order a community placement. Over a period of time, based on this legislation, we will see ICFMRs basically um, downsizing, and in some cases, county nursing homes eliminating that as part of their program and service delivery system. Okay. Um, the community services budget really has been difficult throughout the years, and we've had a waiting list which has grown and grown and grown. Mm -hmm but could you tell us about at least a little bit of good news that came from the county board recently? Absolutely, and um, we were really pleased with the support of the county board supervisors and the community. Um, individuals um, in the community have been on a wait, with developmental disabilities, I should put a parameter around that, have been on a wait list waiting for community-based services. And um, as of today, we have 118 individuals on that wait list, and I need to always clarify that wait list can increase or decrease depending upon what happens, but as of today it's 118. The county board added an additional approximately $200,000 of tax levy into our budget which will allow us to draw down additional federal dollars, in fact 60% federal dollars, 
to address people on the wait list. Based on our estimation of how the um, money can be used, we anticipate beginning in January that we'll be able to reduce the wait list by 30 individuals. Although I'm sure most people would like to see the wait list to totally eliminated, 30 is just a, a really nice start in terms of serving people. Some of those people have been on that wait list since 1999, um, so they've been waiting a long time for services. So um, the um, consumers are, are pleased, the advocates are pleased, and, and definitely for us, um, we're looking forward to being able to provide services to approximately 30 additional people. Um, now on Tuesday night, next week Tuesday, we will be voting, or I should say the county board will be voting on adding a staff position um, to the table of, or actually amending it so that we can have a staff person that will actually do the assessment and provide those case management services to those 30 individuals. So I guess I want to say thank you, Bill, and to the county board supervisors for their support of that. Mm -hmm. Have you any idea where we are percentage-wise as far as having a wait list and compared to other counties? Are we kind of in the middle, higher yeah. or lower? Is it difficult to tell? The state doesn't track that uh -huh. because um, it's not one of those data elements that's in any system. What I do know is those counties that are family care counties have no wait lists. It's just part of the, the family care, managed care process. Unfortunately, the state doesn't have the money to expand family care statewide. There are some counties, such as Calumet County, um, just a little bit to the north of us, that does not have anybody on a wait list. And then there's other counties that have more significant wait lists. So just my best guess without official data is we're probably at the middle, but the top end of the middle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If you could, don't count those family care counties at this point in time. Okay. Then finally, I know our county partners with a lot of other community agencies. Can you talk maybe about how we partner regarding elder abuse or some other? Program. Right, and I, I know that we've talked about elder abuse before because it is a fairly new program. We have a, a M team process, kind of a multidisciplinary team process, both internally and externally, with the elder abuse program. And just to help the the public understand, um, elder abuse would be financial abuse of an elderly person. It could be physical abuse of an elderly person, emotional abuse or it could be self-neglect, where I'm self-neglecting myself as an elderly person and there's nobody to intervene or step in. Um, they, the state looks at about, about, one to, about one third of the elderly population at some point in time suffers from some type of abuse, so it's, it's a fairly significant number. What we've been able to do is partner not only with the Sheriff's Department and the District Attorney's Office, but we've partnered with financial institutions and community organizations, and they form our M team and give us advice. Currently, that M team is targeting financial institutions for education and outreach. Um, financial abuse is really a, a significant area of abuse for the elderly. And um, if you have a teller or someone at the bank that typically is working with an elderly person and can see any unusual activity in their savings account or their trust accounts or whatever it might be, we figure that's going to be one good way to be able to eliminate some of the financial abuse that leads to serious stresses for an elderly person. Um, so it's been a really good partnership with um, the financial institutions um, and they're looking at having a conference in mid-spring and we're still looking for a location in terms of then providing some additional outreach um, to the community on elder abuse. Okay, thank you, Ann. Thanks, Bill. Well, Ann, it's that time of year where the temperatures are dropping and certainly our viewers are aware that teens change the teen temperatures change how you're going to dress and, and get out and about in the community and that can impact both young and the aging. And one of the reasons we have you on this time of the year is the Health and Human Services Department provides some very important programs that help people, especially when the temperatures are dropping as well as just the holiday season. Right. Why don't you touch on some of the, the programs that your department's involved in? Well, I'm going to start with the Energy Assistance Program. and. Um, it's called Wisconsin Housing and Energy Assistance Program. It seems every year they change the title just a little bit. But that does provide some financial assistance to low-income families and individuals, especially the elderly again, in meeting their heating bills and their electric bills um, based on eligibility criteria. And we continue to take applications at this point in time through our job center. And we've done outreach um, at the meal sites and in a variety of other locations throughout the community. Um, that's limited assistance, but it does help people at least a little bit with their heating bills and also provides an assessment if they could use some modifications to the home in terms of energy conservation. 
Um, this past year we also worked with one of the um, steam fitter local organizations and they came in one Saturday in October and we had about 12 elderly low income individuals where they actually went in and did a furnace check and um, went through the house and checked for smoke alarms and that type of thing and they hope to expand that la um, next year in terms of being able to do more homes. Um, at this time of the year, um, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but the flu vaccine shortage really had an a impact in terms of public health, and now that's been expanded a little bit, so people will be hearing more that if you haven't been able to get a flu shot, the population that now can get that has been expanded, so that might help a little bit. I brought something along. It's nothing major, but it's some key things that we want to talk about at this time of the year, and I did share um, copies with the cameraman. But washing our hands at this time of the year is just vitally important, and I won't go in how we do it, but if nothing else prevents the spread of illness and colds, it's definitely washing your hands, and we can't stress that enough for both children and adults. And then we have cover your cough, and I have to laugh at this one, and Adam, we were at a Human Resources Committee meeting where I kept reminding, and Bill was there also, we always tend to cough in our hands. Well, that's one good way now I shake your hand, Adam, and I've spread it. So even though our mothers would always say we shouldn't do this, they recommend <laughs> that you cough into your sleeve, and that way you're not going to be transmitting. So those are some things that we're really focusing on um, at this time of the year in terms of um, disease prevention and control. And good tips and simple ones for people to follow if they just take the time to change their behavior a little right. bit. That coughing the sleeve, though, might upset a few mothers this time of year. Though, <laughs> Not only that, but I keep reminding myself, too, because it's so ingrained in sure. us to put our hand in front of our sure. face. And often when you're with friends or family over the holidays and someone extends their hand to shake it, you're going to shake that hand, mm -hmm. but washing your hands frequently is going to help Absolutely. keep people healthy. So you, you talked about a very important program when it comes to keeping people's homes warm, if especially low income, what have you. What about some of the other programs, such as uh, the Share of the Spirit and oh, right. the Food Donation Program? Yeah. Um, Christmas, and you know, this community has always been generous, and um, yesterday I had the opportunity to go upstairs to our gift room and, and help um, take um, some contributions up. We have groups and individuals that have provided clothing, toys, food products, um, specifically for the, the clients that we serve, from the children in foster care to children with their families to the elderly. Um, and that gift room, um, I, I can't even begin to describe um, the extent of, of the um, goods that have been donated, so it's been fantastic that way. Um, what our staff can do then is go into that gift room and pick out a toy item and a clothing item for every child in the family and also something for each adult in the family. That then is given to the parents or the foster parents to provide to their child. So it's not like, oh, my social worker gave me these Christmas presents, but it's a way to really support um, our families. Share the Spirit has been an ongoing project with the Sheboygan Press and primarily our Division on Aging and Long-Term Support Units. And if you'll notice in the Sheboygan Press, there's a column called Share the Spirit. And in there, it might highlight um, someone by the initials AW, um, age 62, who is residing in a community-based residential facility. Um, we'd really like to get um, out to the beauty shop and get a permanent. Um, and what happens is we have individuals that may agree not only to um, provide that payment for the, the permanent, but actually provide the transportation for that person. Um, and some people are just more than willing to write out a check or, or do a financial donation. Um, we were so fortunate last year uh, with a, a fairly sizable donation that we had needs that came up over the summer months for people needing things that were elderly or had a disability and were able to actually use Share the Spirit um, to meet those needs also. So it's something as you look through the paper um, and you see what the needs are, you can be matched with a, a particular individual or more than definitely um, send some money and we'll see that those needs are met. Wonderful, wonderful. How about with food donations? We do um, a limited amount with food, and I, I want to stress that because we aren't equipped to handle perishable food, and okay. that's always a key thing. Um, 
last, not this Thanksgiving, but the previous Thanksgiving, what occurred was we had some people drop off actual frozen turkeys and milk products and that type of thing, and we had to get to families rather quickly for that. We do maintain, though, some canned goods, and we have the JCs and a few other groups that do prepare food baskets, and then we match them with an actual family or a person where we can do that type of food donation. And of course, we work closely with the food pantries and the Salvation Army, so we want to make sure that we're not duplicating the service, but definitely supporting what is out there in the community. Well, you, you said it earlier, Ann, we have such a, a generous community, and, and people often are looking to help and sometimes don't know where they can go to make a mm -hmm. contribution. And, for people who are watching this and interested in, in reaching out to someone or providing some assistance, what's the best way for them to contact your department? Okay. We do have a person that does volunteer coordination on a very part-time basis, and that's Pat Priggy. And again, by calling that 459-6400 number, um, that call can be directed to Pat. She's always looking for volunteers, and she is the one that coordinates the holiday donations for us also. Judy Linesey, um, by calling that 6400 number, um, phone calls can be directed to her for Share the Spirit in terms of questions, and she coordinates that. And also our volunteer driver program for the um, elderly in terms of medical transportation, Judy would be able to link you with that. We always need foster families, um, families that are willing to open their doors and their hearts to children who need placement um, outside of the home. And uh, Jackie Erdmeyer, again, through our main number, all you have to do is ask to talk about foster care and that phone call would be directed there. We have a similar need for adults with disabilities in terms of adult family care. And that would be instead of taking in a young child, uh, a family takes in an adult who may have a developmental disability or some other type of disability. And again, um, provide that support um, in the home to that person with a disability to keep them in the community. Um, we do a lot during the course of the year in terms of special functions with school supplies. And again, that would be through the 6400 number. Well, I am just a great uh, overview of uh, all the programs and services. And I know you, you couldn't touch on them all, but in that short mm -hmm. period of time, a, a wonderful overview. And for our viewers who had the opportunity to take this in, please, if you have any questions or if you want to help or if you want to just get involved, don't hesitate to contact Ann or a member of her staff because as you can quickly appreciate, there's a lot of good things happening in Sheboygan County by our Health and Human Services Department. So, Ann, thank you for joining us today. Thank our, you. Next month, our guest will be Chuck Mayer, the airport director, doing a lot of good things out at the Sheboygan County Memorial Airport. And until then, on behalf of County Board Chairman Bill Gehring and myself, Adam Payne, and the Sheboygan County Board of Supervisors, happy holidays. Mm -hmm.